Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. Great, well, good morning, Radiant, so good to be here. My name's Tom, uh, I'm one of the leaders here, and uh, happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. If you have a Bible, could you turn to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 9, it's kind of near the middle of the book. I think uh, if someone had asked, I'm 40 years old, uh, if someone had asked me uh, up until fairly recently to describe myself, one of the characteristics I would definitely have used would be enthusiast. I am an enthusiast, or so I thought, until I came to America. Uh, it, yeah, we've been here for five months as a family now, and I think <laughs> there are so many different cultural things, and it's just been actually uh, overridingly an incredibly wonderful uh, five months. I can really say that with integrity. One of the most uh, beautiful kind of uh, differences or things that is in you that you may not be aware of is your enthusiasm as a country. Just generally, I don't know if you guys have seen the film Trolls. Have you guys seen Trolls? It, you've got basically two families. You've got the Trolls, who are one family led by Princess Poppy, who are the most enthusiastic, happy bunch ever, and then you have the Bergens, who are this sort of grey other people, which I couldn't help but see a bit of a similarity, a bit of a comparison, if you will, between America and England. And uh, maybe it's the weather, I don't know what it is, but even as a kind of an enthusiastic Englishman, I've come here and I have not just met my match. You guys have left me, for, just let, you left me standing. And I particularly when it, <laughs> when it comes to your, your celebration of any kind of holiday, any kind of holiday that you can think of, you want to celebrate it, you know? It's not just Halloween, small h, it's Halloween, you know, with inflatable kind of pumpkins and, you know, it's, and then once that's done, the next moment it's Thanksgiving, woo, it's not long to go till Thanksgiving and then, you know, barely the turkey has gone into our bodies and then it's not long till Christmas. I remember driving back from the coast and to me it still felt like the middle of summer because it was like boiling hot and I got sunburned. I remember driving back and we just pop, popped on the radio and I kid you not, the first one that came up was Frosty the Snowman. And I was like, it, it, surely it cannot, be, it cannot be time to celebrate Christmas already. And the person was like, welcome to Christmas FM. It's only 535 days to go until Christmas or whatever. <laughs> but it is infectious. It's a great, it's a wonderful uh, thing about you. And I, I really mean that. The word enthusiasm comes from the Greek word entheos, which literally means God inside. So, you know, it's a good thing to have, you Americans. It's a wonderful thing. Um, and actually, when I, was, when I was asked to speak at this kind of time of year around Christmas, I almost felt a bit intimidated because I was thinking, this is such a pinnacle of your enthusiasm. Um, you know, light to be going up for what seems like months and reindeers. And, and anyway, it's a lot of celebrations been happening. Um, and I, as I thought and prayed about this, I actually felt a couple of things. I felt, first of all, that if ever there's a time of the year, really, where enthusiasm is genuinely appropriate in terms of Christianity, really, this really is a very appropriate time to be enthusiastic, even if you're more introverted by nature and style. I would theologically say that if we genuinely believe, what's Christmas? It's basically that God has come to this earth as a child. Okay, let's just, you know, simplify everything. God, Christians believe Christmas is that God has come as a child. And if you meditate on this central truth, that really is gloriously enthusiasm-producing good news, no matter what, what you feel like. But I feel like the danger, maybe, could be, potentially, is that we assume that we and our neighbors and our friends and the world in which we live know the reason for the season. That 
But we, we, we realize that, yeah, of course, this is why people get enthusiastic. Because I think it's probably true that certainly in the UK, and I'm sure it's true here as well, that what's actually happening at a kind of popular level is that Christmas no longer for the average person is genuinely in a time of enthusiasm about God coming as a child. But increasingly, when you ask the average person, why are you excited about Christmas? They'll be like, well, we get great trees and lights and presents and Santa's going to come. And, you know, the elf on the shelf, and we're going to get presents, and family's going to be together, and I'm going to have time off from work. And these are not bad things at all, right? They are good things. But the subtle danger is that actually we assume, we assume the world knows the real reason for the season. We assume it in our hearts. We can easily become a people, even if we've heard the gospel of Christmas many times, who functionally put our hope actually in Christmas being a time where I just have a break, where I can have a beer, when I can have rest, have more sleep, be with my family. Whereas what the Bible compels us to centralize, not actually just at Christmas, but particularly at Christmas, is the reason for our enthusiasm, our reason for our celebration is that as it says here in Isaiah 9 that we're about to read, but throughout Scripture, that although there is tremendous darkness and pain in this life, that despite that, the God of this book didn't pull away and go, oh gosh, planet Earth, but He chose to dive headlong into the pain and the evil and the agony of planet Earth and actually to give us all hope. Hallelujah. That's actually what it's about. So let's read familiar verses for many of us. But as we meditate on them, I'm I'm confident that the real reason for the season, the real reason to be genuinely joyful amidst pain is absolutely alive and well. Isaiah 9 verse 1. Nevertheless, it's referring to eight previous chapters that are prophesying judgment and darkness and pain. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. The people who have been walking in tremendous darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. At this moment in history, Israel, Judah, the specific tribes he's speaking to, are in a genuine time of terrifying, real fear. In times past, their nation has been smashing it, just winning on everything. But right now, as they have, as we're going to see, have given them their hearts to other things, God is bringing righteous judgment upon them. And there is very real darkness in the form of all the tribes in the north are systematically being removed and taken off to different countries, never to return. And he's prophesying this in the, it's actually in the past tense, but it's, it's actually yet to happen. It's because he's, it's like those times where you're so sure, you know when you want to encourage someone and bring reassurance to someone in pain, you're saying, hey, listen, honey, it's a done deal. Don't worry about it. Even though it's a future event, the, the prophet here by the Spirit He's actually prophesying something that's so certain, he's actually changed the tense to make it sound even more certain to these people who, like you and I, are feeling tremendous pain, tremendous darkness. You will, you have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you like people rejoice at the harvest time, as men rejoice when plundering, dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment is being rolled up in blood, will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For, how is this going to happen? How is the end of wars going to happen? To us, a child is born. To us, a son is given freely. And the government will be on his shoulders. He will be called, listen, Wonderful counselor. When the Hebrew, it can be translated wonder counselor. I love that. Wonder counselor. 
incredible wisdom, mighty God. So not just wisdom, but incredible power, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there'll be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice, with righteousness, from that time on and forever. Listen, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Father, I bless you for the gospel. I thank you the gospel is good news as it was 2,700 years ago. It is today. It is glorious. There's nothing like it. We never move on to something new. Lord, we celebrate the gospel at Christmas, at Easter, at every day of our lives till you return or you take us home. Come, Lord, and encourage our hearts today that in a world of darkness, you shine all the more brightly. In Jesus' name, amen. Two points then we're just going to briefly look at today that Isaiah speaks about that really are what Christmas is all about. The real reason why it's genuinely appropriate to be very enthusiastic. First of all, it tells us that God has come, that God has come. And secondarily, that he came initially as a child. Those two elements are gloriously powerful to us um, and very practically helpful for us as we live at such a time as this. So first of all then, that God has come. What I'm trying to say is this, is that Isaiah here speaking to a people who were, to quote him, in darkness. They're in darkness. Isn't that interesting? You see, God is not defensive about his world. Many of us are rather defensive, aren't we? If, if any kind of imperfection, you know, that's noticed in your child or in your house or in anything, you're like, I'm fine, they're fine, we're great. You know, but God isn't like that. God's so secure. I love that about the Christian God. He's so secure. He's like, the world that my people are living in is terribly dark. Incredibly dark. Just let that sink in. The God of the Bible doesn't call us to pretend. Now, the reality is, for most of us, our lives are a mix. They are a mix. Paul put it, I just think, brilliantly in Corinthians. He says, describing himself, sorrowful, yet rejoicing. Sorrowful, yet rejoicing. Starts here, the context that we celebrate the coming of God is one of darkness. For these guys, the actual historical moment that was happening, 700 BC, that Isaiah was speaking to them, as I said, was this terrifying, impending doom. God was judging them, and they were about to be taken off to Assyria. Judah ended up in Babylon. God was, it was very, very real, okay? Their security was, was being stripped away from them. They were feeling that sense of vulnerability, that sense of darkness. Now, you're probably not feeling that same exact context, but let me just communicate to you the same beautiful kind of openness about darkness that God speaks here to them is the same God here today. I know that many of you coming in here will be tempted to put a brave face on your life. And um, honestly, for me, um, about two and a half weeks ago, you know how, if you follow Christ for a while, you notice this, he suddenly like, it's like his agenda, his moment, his agenda for your now, what he wants you to learn now, just sort of changes as you grow. And it was almost like a, a switch flicked. And it was like everyone I started to speak to five months into being in California, everyone I spoke to started to just tell me their life story. And um, honestly, it was just heartbreaking. It just broke my heart at the level of widespread abuse. Widespread abuse. So many beautiful people, many in this church and others, were just telling me matter-of-factly about growing up in such a situation where this was, the, this was normal, this was normal, and generation that we, we were taught how to do meth by this family member, and then, and then he abused me. And, and, and it was, it's just like everyone I was speaking to was just pouring out their hearts, just telling me the same story. And when you, you know this, but the reputation of California globally is kind of like, it's almost like the promised land, you know, it's kind of like, 
the shiny place where all the stars and everything always is sunny. And I just I felt myself really weighed down in my soul. Not in a bad way. Not in a, in a way that I'm resentful for. Actually, in a way, I feel like God is starting to soften my soul for the reality of the darkness that you live in, that we live in, that I live in. Just amidst all of this going on, I just, just came, came home and I was just, I was just like, man, Lord, what else? And I remember talking to my kids, like, hey guys, how was your day at school? Hoping for a bit of like, relief. And Daisy said, oh yeah, yeah, we had a gunman at school today. We had to hide under our tables for half an hour. And at this point, my mum and dad, my elderly mum and dad, relatively elderly, as I listen to this, were, were Skyping in from England. And Daisy just came in matter-of-factly talking about a gunman. And they had to... Now, what actually happened was it was, a, it was called a, a code black practice where you practice it. <laughs> you practice in case a gunman comes and, and the massacre is imminent. Now, I, I know you're used to this and this is, not, no, this is not a strange thing for you, but from a protected little Englishman, I was just like, wow, okay. That's part of our life now, is to be ready. And, and none of us want that, do we? None of us are saying we, we want that to be part of our life, but it's, it's reality. And so there is a darkness that we're living in. But what I love about this passage and this world of pain that we're living in is that God does not, He doesn't do what I tend to do. When I'm around people in pain, I tend to bring up the drawbridge, you know? If someone starts to talk to me about the issues of their life, I may keep smiling, da da da. But I, I'm often thinking, how can I now kind of self protect? You know? Classic Christian technique, you kind of cut them off halfway. Let me pray for you. That's a sort of socially acceptable way of saying, please be quiet. And let me just, you know, I mean, I'm not always saying, I'm not, yeah, I love to pray for you, but I just feel like, what is Christmas about? Is it this sort of like Santa's coming down the chimney thing? Well, actually, it starts with the beautiful reality that God sees the darkness. I know that's so simple. He sees the darkness of the world in which we live. It's, it's different context. It's the same darkness. Issues of mental health. On the app, it's like an epidemic scale. Mental health, depression, anxiety, fear, gripping people more and more and more. And I love it that our God doesn't pull away. Maybe you had parents who, who didn't allow you to be weak. You had to be strong. I love the way in 2 Corinthians... Paul, the great Paul, the theologian of theologians, the strong man of strong man who could, you know, probably run rings around Einstein. He, though, in his total brokenness, says, in his darkness, where he says, I was despairing of life. That's code for depression, I think. I was pretty low. He just says, but this was so that I do not rely on myself, but on God who raises the dead. On him I have set my hope. On him who raises the dead. He is the Father of compassion, he describes. He says, praise be, 2 Corinthians 1, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. Isn't that amazing? Even Jesus needed a God of compassion and comfort. Jesus, the ultimate strong one. How is his dad described by Paul in the Spirit? Oh, Jesus' dad, he wasn't like the ultimate coach who got the best out of his son. He, even for Jesus, he's a father of compassion. A God of all comfort, who comforts us in every trouble, every trial. Not just the big, dramatic ones that we go through in those rare times, but in every moment of our life. Guys, this is wonderful news. Because you know, I want your Christmas to be, you know, ding, ding, digga, digga, ding. I want you to have lots of friends and family and shiny trees. And stuff. I love it. But you know what? I have got the best news ever for you. Even if you have nothing resembling what the world says Christmas is about, today you are hearing through the lips of me, but ultimately through this Bible, that there is a God in heaven who is so overflowing in compassion and mercy and grace, it would blow our brains if we could fully understand it. He's so kind. And what's so amazing is he's so kind to Israel and to you and I, and Israel was a mess. 
That's the amazing twist I hadn't even seen until recently. I'm like, oh, poor Israel. They're having a terribly tough time. Come on, God, hurry up and deliver them. That's how we can read it, can't we? Is it just me? You feel sorry for Israel. They're in this tough spot. And come on, God, deliver them. Oh, well done. You're doing it eventually. About time. Whereas when you read this, Isaiah 1, you read it in your own time, God's heart is breaking over this people. They're led by a king at this moment who was a guy called King Ahaz in his 20s who was leading the whole nation into child abuse, child sacrifice. He was offering, he offered up his son to the, the God of Moak. This was, you see, we, we, what's amazing about this is it starts with talking about the, the darkness and the pain that the world feels. And it says, you don't have to hide it. You can be real. There's no shame. The light has come. Jesus has come. And he is the one that covers our shame. But what's even more amazing is that Isaiah begins as a book actually talking about the God in pain. It's actually God who's in pain. As he sees the world around us, it talks about him saying, I raised you as a child, but you've, you've forsaken me. You've rejected me. Isaiah 1 tells us of the heart of God in pain. God himself feeling tremendous pain over this world. Now that is amazing when you think about this passage. God here through Isaiah, when he says the people walking in darkness have seen great light. A light has dawned. When he's offering hope to them, which was historically going to be rescue from exile, they'll have rescue, they'll have exile for 70 years, but he's saying, I'm going to bring you back. It's also, of course, a prophecy about Jesus coming, the ultimate light bringer. But it's also even more a prophecy about every single Christian, that when you become a Christ follower, the Bible tells us he shines his light into our hearts. It says, God, like, like he did at the beginning of time when there was just darkness everywhere, he's, he shone light and he began creation. That's what he's done in every single person now who would say they're a Christian. But the amazing thing about this is, is that God is promising this. He is promising rescue. He is promising giving a child, his son, who will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Priests, to a people who are absolutely evil. Judah at this moment, they were not a great church to be part of. Okay, if you read it, 2 Kings 16, it tells us vividly about how far they've gone from, from where they should have been. They should have been a beacon of hope and righteousness and joy and loving the poor, protecting the widows, looking after the orphans, generous, filled with the joy of the Lord, and yet they were pursuing a demonic agenda. And yet, to those people, we hear this promise. You see, I wonder what it, when, it, when it says, when Isaiah said, for to us a child will be born, a son is given. Think about that. God is saying to Isaiah by the Spirit, hey, Isaiah, tell this evil people who hate me that I'm actually eventually going to send my son. Yeah, my, that's what you heard correctly. My only son. Tell them that. I'm going to send my son who will grow up to be this incredible, glorious Messiah who will rescue them. The grace of God. The grace of God. You see, Romans 4 says this. For to him or her who does not work, who doesn't work, okay, so the antithesis of the great American work ethic to the one who does not work, the one who's a couch potato, who will not get off his bum and actually do stuff, to the one who does not work, but listen, who trusts him who justifies the wicked, to him his faith is counted as righteousness. Doesn't that offend us? Or is that just me? You see, what I'm saying is, the message of Isaiah, the message of God saying, I'm going to bring light, I'm going to bring hope to you, is not just a message of comfort to a people who really need to hear it. It's actually to a people who are a complete sinful mess. And that's just even more glorious, my friends. Because when we, when we identify with this time of darkness, when we say, yeah, my life is filled with pain, sometimes that pain is because of others doing stuff to us that is just unjust. Sometimes we are not in any sense guilty for the pain that is just in our life. It's just there. 
right? But sometimes, often, there is also element of our own sinfulness, the way we react to things done against us, the way that we interpret what's happened. And it's this incredible mix. And, and I was thinking about this recently. Of, I was just in the mall yesterday, and, and I was thinking about this. And I was seeing people, and at one level, I was finding myself just sort of smiling at people, just wanted just to be friendly. But then at the same time, I was thinking, but I wonder what the reality of his life is like. I wonder if there's dark things that he's done. And I found myself in this place of feeling both love and compassion, but then also a sense of but the reality. And we are that mix, aren't we? All of us are a mix. And yet what is so glorious is that the grace of God, there's so much grace. If God was willingly speaking to Isaiah to prophesy to an evil nation, I'm going to send my beautiful son. I mean, think about that if you're a parent. The emotion of our father willingly saying to Isaiah, tell them that I'm going to rescue them. And the only way that they can be rescued is actually through the most costly, agonizing way of me sending my beautiful son, who is totally righteous and totally perfect and totally innocent, into that disgusting world in order to rescue them. Man, if you are a parent or even if you've just got a heartbeat, you will understand the protective instinct of a parent towards your child, your child is probably the deepest thing hardwired in us. You'll do anything to protect your child. I know I would for Daisy, Lillian, Poppy, my kids. There's something in me that's so deep. I cannot fathom how God did this. I, can't, I cannot fathom how God sent his only son and how Jesus joyfully, gloriously went along with it and wanted to do it. Man, the grace of the, of the gospel, it is our great and only hope. <laughs> I love it. I just love it. It's so scandalous to the one who does not work but justifies him who, no, to the one who does not work but trusts him who justifies the ungodly to him, his righteousness. His faith is counted as righteousness. Man, just this, as I was meditating on that, I, there was a moment in our household where I felt an injustice had been done by a certain member of my, of my household. I was really annoyed about it, you know. I was like, oh, and then I felt the grace of I just pictured the grace of God towards a wicked people. And I suddenly thought, but, but that's me. That's, I can see it in others. And I, get, I, get, I see the scandal. But Lord, when I realize it, that's my only hope. I'm so much worse than I realize. I'm so much worse than I I see probably 1% occasionally on a good day of the thoughts and the motives of my heart that are not good. And God just pumps out grace, 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 grace. This Isaiah 9 is not just some nice little kind of, you know, get the kids to read it because it's a nice little Christmassy verse. It's the grace of God. It's the scandal of God that God is promising honor to a people who were repulsive. It's amazing. It, 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 it short circuits our brains. And if you're here and perhaps you think, well, to be a Christian means you have to be good and then you get forgiven. It's the other way around. At your very worst, when you're not even looking for God, God promises rescue and redemption. It's the scandal of grace. And it changes us. This is, what, this is, this is why Christmas is so brilliant. It's because God came. He was proactive. You're, you probably, when, I, when I, I pull away from pain, God dives into pain. And, I, and God wants you to learn this quickly. That although we have other humans around us which are wonderful and a genuine blessing most of the time, your truest friend, who you cannot see yet with your eyes, he is always the wonder counselor. He is always the prince of peace. And, and so often in my life, I go anywhere else. Before eventually, in an exhausted, crumpled heap, I suddenly remember God. Oh, I should probably pray. I should probably just surrender my heart as best as I can to the wonder counselor, to the prince of... And boom, he comes. He's so faithful to someone who was so, so wicked. It's the grace of God. It's glorious. It's, it's a life changer. And he wants us to live in the good... He wants you to be able to be real this Christmas. That if there is pain and darkness in your life, if mental health is a reality for you or someone close to you, or whatever it may be. He, he wants us to go, no, no, no. We can come 
confident that the Christmas story has guts to it. Do you understand? The Christmas story is not some little twee thing. It is this incredible, robust event that was spoken about hundreds of years before it happened. And we look to it and we go, thank you, God, that in my own darkness, you don't recoil. You turned your face away from your son so that you'll never turn your face away from me. So number one, it's about God coming. It's about his proactivity. And that is glorious. But what I also want to just touch upon before we finish today is the other key element of the Christmas story is that he came as a child. It says here, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And we get so familiar with this, don't we? We just think, oh, who cares? You know, it's for my kids to like, you know? Oh, isn't he cute? Came in a manger. And I was just thinking about this. And I thought, no, actually, God doesn't, he doesn't waste anything. There is a deliberate wisdom in this part of the Christmas message. It's not just that God came. You see, I can, in my better moments, when someone's in pain, try and, you know, respond and be proactive if I don't pull away. But I'm often just clumsy. I'm often quite kind of like trying to fix them. Or, I don't know, just get frustrated with it. But there's something about this beautiful picture of God coming, and it starts, his incarnation starts in this gentle manner. He shoots, he, God, the Christian God, is gloriously powerful, okay? He made everything. So, just, he is God Almighty. Uh, I was at Fresno Zoo this week, and uh, I was in the, uh, in the reptile house or something, and I was just literally blown away looking at these crazy animals and thinking, I would have never seen them if someone hadn't gone and got them and brought them to Fresno Zoo. And just God's such an amazing showman, you know? The glory of his creation. He's big. He is big. The Bible tells us that there's moments where God is big, as it were. He demonstrates his power, ultimately, at the resurrection. There's a bigness to it. But there's also, which we often, I often overlook, there's a smallness, there's a gentleness to the way God works works with humans that is so easy to overlook particularly when we generally love to celebrate the big don't we big is always best often it's got to be the biggest car the biggest house whatever you know we we humans tend to think big is always best but there's something about the gospel message at this christmas particularly if you're in pain the fact that he came as a child i i can't get my head around that somehow it brings me comfort Somehow it teaches me something. Somehow it brings to me a reminder that you can be weak and you're not failing. It's just something about the embracing of that aspect of humanity that is profoundly, gloriously important to us. See, you, you may have known Jesus for a while, one of the tactics of the enemy is to whisper to us that um, God only truly works in big ways. Yeah? The events, the moment where we come forward for prayer and boom, it's all changed. In an instant, everything happens. Or by us looking and comparing ourselves with other Christians who seem to have this kind of big, dramatic walk with God. And what often happens is we just quietly then discount our own walk. We just think, well, I don't know. I, I think God's speaking, but I'm not really sure. So, And what happens is, and I feel that for many of you, as, as I was thinking about this, I think there's many in this room where there's actually, bit, where God wants to invade your almost hopelessness on this. You just think, oh, it's not for me. I'm just going to busy myself with work. Because although I do believe in God. I'm a Christian. I don't identify with this idea of kind of an intimacy, a daily intimacy of walking with him. And it's because so often we discount the fact that the voice of God, the way he speaks to us is so often gentle and sort of easily overlooked if we're not having ears to hear. It's so easy to do. And if you're successful, if you're gifted, you're probably even more prone to miss this. God blessed me in England with tremendous things going well at the church 
And that was actually almost at the biggest danger because my brain was constantly filled with adren- adrenaline-fueled things to think about, which were holy and righteous and things to make everything better. And during my sabbatical, I just, I just came back to this realization. You know, my dad, my dad, my father, my dad in, in heaven, has been speaking to me all the time. And I had just not had ears to hear. And it, it wasn't speaking me to me for others, primarily. It was speaking to me for me. And that every day, if I had ears to hear, in just normal watching the TV, listening to the radio, picking up a book, looking at a sunset, driving along with my kids, that he was speaking. And I tell you what, when, when, when you start to realize that this is the gift of God to be, to be given to his children, it, it kind of is a bit of a game changer. Because in life, although the other things in life, which we all want, we want you know, health, wealth, things to go well, families, friendships, and all of those things are not often bad. When you start to realize that actually the real kingdom work, the real kingdom is, is here, I say, let my kingdom come. Let the king reign and rule. Let him speak to me during my day. You, you are genuinely equipped more than ever in your life to go through the highs and the lows and everything in between. And I genuinely believe for many of us here today that God is inviting you today at this Christmas time when we think about God coming as a child, as a baby, to allow fresh faith to come. I think for some of you men as well, particularly, you, 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 you do believe in God, but there's this intimacy deal. And the Lord is saying His voice is often, it's, it's often gentle, but it's very real. And the final thing I want to say is this. God, the, the, the reason we get excited, the reason for enthusiasm, the reason for joy, is that God has come as a child. God, Jesus, came to give his life for us, even though we did not deserve it. And the fact that he came as a child is tremendously encouraging to us for the reasons I've mentioned. But it's not just that God coming as a child tells us about the way of God, the flavor of God, the style of God, as it were. That's true. But of course, the reality is it's also incredibly profound when we think about what is the aim of God for all of us. What is his great aim? When he comes, does he come just to forgive us? Just to forgive us? No. He forgives us that we might be adopted. This is really, really, really profound. That to be a Christian is not just I in the law courts have been forgiven, although that's true. I, something has been removed, my guilt. I am then clothed with a spirit of adoption. I am dealt with in the court of law through Jesus at the cross, getting in trouble with God on my behalf. For everything I did, Christ took the blame. Hallelujah. And when he was raised from the dead, it proved and gloriously authenticated the reality now that for all of us who put our faith in him and his death and resurrection, we're not just forgiven, we are now adopted as his children. You see, there's something, it's almost like God, when, when he... When he came as a child, he wanted us to look at that child and think about that child and realize that for all of us as Christians, this is the one right that is promised to us in Scripture. There's no other rights that I can find. No other thing that we're entitled to. Nothing. We're not entitled to anything as humans apart from one thing. In John chapter 1, it says he's been given, we have been given the right to be called children of God by the grace of God. And so to become a child of God means that we are those that now there's an innocence that's recovered. Often the abuse and the difficult things, the darkness first comes in childhood, doesn't it? And we see here at Christmas when we think about Jesus coming as a baby, coming as a child. And it's a picture of what the great 
gospel hope for all of us is, is that we're not just forgiven. There's something of God's passion to make children. That when you are a, a Christian, you're added into his family. That Jesus is the eternal son of God. He's not the father. He's the son. He relied on his father. His father had the plans. His father was responsible. His father was the provider. That's why Jesus was so joyful and relaxed. He was sorrowful at the pain of the world, but he was also so full of joy because he was the eternal son. And that's what we are given by the grace of God. Hallelujah. It's the game changer. It's the thing that that is our identity. That is our label. You are not primarily a mother or a father. We are all children of God. That means we never ultimately have to have a plan. Our dad has got the plan. Hallelujah. We don't ultimately have to provide. He is the provider. Jesus was so at peace because he knew his father was so sufficient, so competent, so compassionate, so merciful. And that's why Christmas is so profound when we think about God coming as a baby, as a child. Let's not miss the reality that that is our destiny. That is our reality even now. That God wants to restore innocence for a world that's lived in darkness. A world that's been brought up where childhood is so often robbed at a young age for so many of us. When you become a Christian, there's, a, there's an innocence that he wants to recover. There's a joy. There's a sense of, I don't have to be, I don't have to be impressive. <laughs> I'm a child of God. I'm, I'm, he's the impressive one. My Father in heaven, this is the plan he concocted up. The, the, the plan that he gloriously enacted, it's all about him. I'm just brought into this family where now I receive. It's all grace. I receive everything from start to finish. I think that's fairly good news at Christmas. Is it good news? Is, it, is Christmas about trees? I love trees, don't get me wrong. Is it about Santa? Nothing against Santa. Or is it about a gospel that's so glorious, so amazing, that man, we just never get tired of rejoicing in it. Amen? Let's stand to our free friends. Trevor's going to lead us in a song of response. And as we do that, listen, we've got um, bread and wine up here. If you want to respond by specifically coming and, and as you eat the bread and as you drink the juice, physically reminding yourself, oh, this God who came. He came and he gave his very life for us. We're going to have guys up here who would love to pray with you. Perhaps as I've spoken, there's been some things in your heart that you think, yeah, I, I resonate with that and I want to today. I, wanna, I just want to go the extra mile and seal it today that the Lord, he's the Lord, he's not, he's not, uh, he's not shocked by the darkness He's not put off by it. He runs into it. He's the one God who does that. You'll never find that in any other religion. He's the one God who came and died on a cross, going to the ultimate dark place to make light that can never be put out, light that can never diminish, light that can never ultimately be extinguished. Father, we bless you. We thank you that Christmas really is an incredible thing. And I just pray, Lord God, today that you will, just even in these last few moments, You'll minister to our hearts. And just, Lord, yeah, Lord, we won't put our hope in the secondary stuff. But our hope will be in this beautiful intimacy you've given us. Cost you everything, Lord. Cost you everything. Cost you everything to get that intimacy for us. And so we just rest. We just rest in your commitment to us. It's so amazing. And we, we just love it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. So please connect with us at radiantvicelia.com. Until next time. There is a heavenly city that I'm compelled to find. Oh, I love the flowers and trees and the smell of the grinding sea. And all the beautiful things here in life. And I